series in Romans this morning. So will you give a warm welcome to Dr. Chad Ragsdale. Good morning. I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah, like, like Daniel was saying, um, this is uh, actually the, my 20th year at Ozark. So at, by the end of this year, I'll have been at Ozark Christian College in Joplin for 20 years. And my family and I, we love it there. It's very much home. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Um, but I, I always like to say this whenever I'm speaking on the weekends at different churches, uh, that o places like Ozark could not, should not, would not exist were it not for the prayers, the encouragement, and the support of churches just like this one. Um, we know that we live in a world that is desperate for the truth of Jesus Christ. We live in a world that is desperate for the hope that is found only in the gospel. We know li that we live in a world where Jesus said, look, the, the fields are ready for harvest. We need to pray that harvest workers are raised up to work those fields. We, we know that the need is great. And I'm so glad to be able to work in a place whose mission is dedicated to raising up men and women to work in the kingdom, to do that kingdom work. And again, we so much appreciate the prayers and the support that churches like this one give us for that work. Um, I want to start this morning by saying a few words, and when I say these words, I want you to reflect on how you feel or what you think immediately upon hearing these words. So what do you feel, what do you think as soon as you hear these words? So here's the first words, ice cream. What do you feel as soon as you hear the words ice cream? I love ice cream. I think most people love, I mean, that's not a controversial thing to say. Um, not a brave thing to say. I bravely say that I like ice cream. Um, no, I mean, most of us, we love ice cream. There's a handful of us that maybe, you know, you hear ice cream and it makes your tummy hurt because you're like, nope, ice cream, that's not for me. Um, but what do you feel as soon as you hear ice cream? Or let, let me give you another one. What do, you, what do you feel as soon as you hear the words Chicago Cubs? What do you, what do you feel? What do you think? Now, it's, it's, uh, it's October 6th, which means that for me as a Cubs fan, I am um, I'm full of sadness because once again, uh, the Cubs have let me down. So when I, when I hear the word Chicago Cubs, I, I feel sadness. Um, Many Cardinals fans in the room, I'm sure you feel sadness as well. Um, wasn't an awesome year. Here's, here's, another, here's another word, or a couple words. Pumpkin spice. What do, you, what do you think, what do you feel when you hear the words pumpkin spice? Some of you are like, oh, I love me some pumpkin spice. Can't get me enough pumpkin spice. Give me pumpkin spice everything. Go down to Discount Tire, get me some pumpkin spice tires for my car. I can't get enough pumpkin spice. Some of you are like, enough with the pumpkin spice. It's too much. Can't handle it. Enough with the pumpkin spice. Here's another word. Politics. What do, you, what do you immediately think? What do you immediately feel when you hear the word politics? Now, some of you, when you hear the word politics, you're like, let's go! You're so excited. And you've got the Facebook page to prove it. Um, you are all in on politics. I mean, you don't throw away the political flyers you get in the mail. You hang them on your refrigerator. Okay, you've got the sign up in your yard. You are motivated. Can't wait to vote. Can't wait to tell everyone else how you're voting. Like you're excited. Some of you, you hear the word politics and you are tired. You are weary. I found this statistic in 2022. Americans received 15 billion political text messages. And some of you are like, I feel like I received most of those 15 billion text messages. I'm weary. I'm tired. Can we just get past this election already? Some of you, when you hear the word politics, you flinch. You flinch because to you, politics means conflict. 
Politics means disagreement, maybe even disagreement in your own home, around your own kitchen table. So you're ready, you're ready to move beyond politics. You'd rather talk about almost anything other than politics because when you hear this word, you flinch. Now, here's what I want you to hear. Each one of those three responses is fine. Each one of those three responses is fine and appropriate. But here's, here's what we can't really deny. What we can't really deny is that politics, for better or for worse, politics is a significant part of our lives in this world. Right? We can't deny that. For better or for worse, politics is a significant part of our lives. Now, if that's the case, if politics is a significant part of our lives, then what that also means is that our faith, our theology, our beliefs also should have something to say to our politics. If it's true that my faith in Jesus my beliefs about God, if it's true that those beliefs have something to say to every square inch of my life in this world, if that's true, and I believe that it is, then what that also means is my faith should have something to say to my politics. My politics doesn't exist independently or separate from those things that I believe as a Christian. Now, I want you to relax. I'm not this morning going to tell you how to vote, okay? It's not my role, not my purpose, not my intent. But I do want to give you this morning a few principles to think about as a Christian in this political season. And I'm going to unpack those principles from the book of Romans, from Romans chapter 13. I'm going to read just the first seven verses of Romans 13. Here's what it says. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. For the rulers, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants to give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Now, what you need to understand is, Romans 13, especially these seven verses in Romans 13, are among the most difficult verses in the entire book of Romans. So I'm very thankful that this is the passage that I was given this morning to preach. Um, These are some of the most difficult verses in the book of Romans to understand. I think in order to to go about understanding these verses, we've got to spend a little bit of time unpacking the historical context in which Paul is writing Romans. Got to understand a little bit about what was going on in the world at that time. So, there was this emperor in the first century. His name was Claudius. And um, uh, there was was a point under Claudius' reign where there was this uh, disruption, this upheaval that was happening in Rome. Roman historians tell us about this. There was this upheaval that was happening in Rome, and Roman historians tell us that this uprising or this upheaval was caused by some guy named Crestus, which is a Latin form of the word Christ. In other words, from the Roman perspective, the Jews were fighting amongst themselves about this guy named Christ, and it was causing all sorts of problems in that community. So Claudius, in the year 49 AD, first century, Claudius says, y'all get out. Get out of Rome. I'm kicking you out of Rome. So Claudius kicked out all of the Jews, including all of the Jewish Christians, kicked them out of Rome because of this disruption that they were causing. By the year 54, so just five years later, Claudius was dead. Some people say he was murdered, but he died, okay? And he was replaced by another guy named Nero. 
Now, Nero would eventually go crazy. <laughs> Nero would eventually lose his mind. In the year 59 AD, Nero has his mother killed. He descends into madness. Bad dude, Nero. Um, Nero would eventually have many Christians executed and killed because they were following Jesus, including Paul himself was killed by Nero. But Paul wrote Romans, this book of Romans, he wrote this probably around the year 57. That's what most scholars believe about Romans. So Paul wrote Romans during a time of peace in Rome. During a time of peace. So his plea to these Christians in Romans 13 was for them to respect their governing authorities. They were not, he said, to be troublemakers. They were not to be lawbreakers. Instead, be good citizens of Rome, including paying your taxes. Now, what are we to make of this passage for us today? How do we, living in our world today, in our context today, how do we live out, how do we apply a passage like Romans 13? Because we don't live in ancient Rome. We don't live under a Caesar. We don't live under a king. We live in a nation where we get to participate in our government by voting or maybe even running for office. So what does Romans 13 have to say to you and I today during this political season? Well, I want to unpack there's a lot of details we could get into in these verses, but I want to unpack just three big ideas, just three principles from Romans 13 about how we can conduct ourselves during this political season. Three principles. First principle is this. Every authority is under God. Every authority is under God. In verse 1, he says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, he says. What we might not at first recognize when we read this verse, though, is that Paul is actually giving the king a demotion. It was pretty standard, in fact, for the emperor in the first century to be declared divine. After his death, the, de the emperor would be, be declared divine. Divine, And there were even a small number of emperors that while they were still living, they claimed divinity for themselves. We are gods in your midst. There was a whole imperial cult that was centered around worshiping the emperor. And cities in the ancient world, they would actually compete with each other for the privilege of building temples dedicated to the worship of various emperors. So it would have come as quite a surprise to any of these emperors to learn that they were actually subjected to the authority of God, particularly the God of these despised Christians. So Paul, Paul puts the king in his place. He gives the king a demotion here and says the king exists, the authorities exist underneath the authority of God. There is a principle that runs all throughout Scripture all throughout Scripture, that says leadership, whatever that leadership looks like, is a heavy responsibility because leaders are not just responsible to their board or to their stakeholders. Leaders aren't just accountable to the bottom line. Leaders in Scripture are ultimately accountable to God. So we see this principle like in, in 1 Peter 5, okay? In 1 Peter 5, um, Peter, in this, in this context, is talking about leaders in the church. And he calls these leaders in the church shepherds. These leaders are shepherds. But Peter reminds them that as shepherds of the flock, you only lead underneath the authority of the chief shepherd. You are accountable to him. You are account your leadership is accountable to God. This is a theme and a principle that runs all throughout Scripture. And I think what is true of the church is also true even beyond the church. Leaders shouldn't think that they lead by their own strength or for their own purposes. Leaders, are, leaders lead under the authority of a sovereign God. So, we may elect a president, but that person is only president under the sovereign authority of God, even the person that doesn't even recognize God 
or recognize the authority or maybe even recognize the existence of God. Even that person, guess what? That person exists only underneath the authority of God. As Christians, this means two things, just really quickly. This idea, this principle means two things. The first thing that it means is this. We should treat our leaders with respect. Because they lead underneath the authority of God, we should treat them with respect. Paul makes that pretty clear in this passage when he says, let everyone be subject to ruling authorities. Now that word subject there, it doesn't mean blind obedience. The word subject also doesn't mean agreement. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything that a leader does or says or believes. Matter of fact, you look at the, the leaders, the various leaders that we have in this country, you probably shouldn't agree with many things that they say or do or believe. That's not what this word means. This word means instead to willingly place ourselves underneath the leadership of another. It's a word that recognizes and respects authority because that authority ultimately comes from God. Now, there are some limits to this, and I'll get into some of those limits here in just a moment. But for now, I'll just say that because our leaders are underneath God's authority, we should give them our respect, regardless of political party, regardless of whether we voted for them or didn't vote for them, they are worthy of our respect. The second, um, uh, the second thing that this means is this. We should also be careful not to treat our leaders as gods. So we respect them because they, they lead under the authority of God. But on the other hand, we should be very careful that we don't treat our leaders, our political leaders or other leaders, as gods themselves. Now, we don't have, in our culture, like, we don't have presidents running around claiming to be divine, right? Like, we don't have a cult dedicated to the worship of dead presidents. That's not what we have. But I do sometimes worry that we have the tendency, yes, even in the church, we have the tendency to turn our political leaders into idols and saviors. We anxiously look to our politicians for hope. We allow our religion to be used by our politicians as a mere prop. Now, here's the thing. Very rarely will a person intentionally or willfully choose for himself or choose for herself an idol. Like, hey, here's my idol. Here's the idol that I'm worshiping. Here's the idol that I'm dedicating. Very rarely do we like explicitly make that decision. Usually what happens with our idolatry is it just kind of gradually creeps in. We're not thinking about it. We're not aware of it. That idolatry just gradually creeps in. And before we know it, We've actually placed someone or something else in the place of God. And so we get defensive about this idol. We protect this idol. We look to this idol for hope. And I, get, I do get a little bit worried that the way that Christians sometimes talk about politics and talk about politicians borders on idolatry. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul is talking to a group of people. The Philippian, the Philippian people actually were very proud of the fact that they were citizens of Rome. So if you lived in Philippi, you also got the privileges of being a citizen of Rome. They were very proud of this fact. And so Paul in Philippians is, 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 is warning them about having their, their minds set on just earthly things. And so he says in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship, hey, Philippi, remember, you might be proud of your Roman citizenship, but don't forget, your ultimate citizenship is in heaven. He could say the same thing to us today. Don't forget, Christian, your citizenship is in heaven. And, he says, we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important for us to remember that our Savior is from heaven. Our Savior is not from Washington, D.C. November's election, November's election will cause me neither elation nor despair. Why? Because Jesus is on his throne regardless of what happens. Now, generally, 
I'm not a fan of cynicism. I'm not. I think cynicism is toxic. I think cynicism, or generally cynicism is bad for our spiritual lives. It's bad for our emotional lives. Cynicism is something that we should try to keep at an arm's length. I do make an exception for politicians, though. <laughs> I think one of the best ways to steal ourselves or protect ourselves from the, the idolatry that tends to circulate around politicians is to develop just a little bit of cynicism about the things they claim or the things they promise. Just remember, we don't look to, to, to any politician or any leader for our salvation. Our salvation is already secured in Jesus Christ. So be careful, Christian, that you don't turn your politics and your politicians into an idol. Here's the second principle from Romans 13 quickly. Second principle is this. Not only do all leaders exist under the authority of God, but number two, God desires justice and order. That's the second principle that I see from Romans 13. God desires as a good thing. God desires justice and God desires order. Uh, my daughter, my 15-year-old daughter, wonderful, love her to death, beautiful, smart, respectful daughter, but we have this one conflict that we consistently have over and over and over again. The conflict is about the status of her bedroom. So I will walk in, I'll open up her door, I'll walk in to wake her up in the morning, and I will not be able to see any of the floor um, because the floor is covered up with chaos. My daughter chooses to live in chaos, so there's, instead of seeing her floor, I see stuffed animals strewn all around. I see uh, dirty clothes everywhere. I see books. I see papers. I see all of this chaos. Parents, can any of you identify with what, with what I'm talking about? And so we, we enter into this pattern, this, this consistent argument that we have where I'll tell her, her name's Ryan. I'll say, Ryan, this room is unacceptable. You have to clean this room. Matter of fact, I'm not going to let you do anything today until you get this room cleaned. And she'll fight me and she'll fuss about it and she, you know, she doesn't want to clean her room, but eventually she'll do it. And it's, again, it's this pattern. It repeats itself over and over again where she'll clean her room and then she'll tell me at some point later in the day, she'll say, Dad, I actually do feel kind of better now. I'm like, oh, yeah, you think? It's like, yeah, you know, I feel like I can actually now rest in my room. I feel a little bit more at peace in my room. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know why? Because wherever chaos exists, it's really hard to experience peace. Wherever chaos exists, it's really hard to experience peace. Wherever chaos exists, it's really hard to experience flourishing and growth and happiness. One of the things that we learn from Romans 13 is we learn this principle, that where there is chaos, there is no justice. Where there is chaos, there's no peace, there's no flourishing. And you get the idea that God wants justice and order in a nation. These are good things. It's a good thing for there to be justice in a nation. It's a good thing for there to be order in a nation. And it's a government's job to actually provide these things. So that's why he says in this passage, those who rebel bring punishment on themselves, and that punishment is deserved because what they're doing is they're disturbing the peace. They're disturbing the order of a nation, which to God is a good thing, that that, that order should be preserved. This is part of the reason why in, in another passage in the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 2, this is again Paul writing, and Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, pray for your leaders. Pray for your leaders. Now, why do we do that? Why, why should we pray for our leaders? Well, he tells us the reason we pray for our leaders is because we desire to live in peace, and we desire for all people to live in peace. We desire for our neighbors to live in peace. We desire for our communities to experience flourishing and growth, and so one of the reasons we pray for our leaders is because that is just so terribly important, that we want to live in a land, we want to live in a community that is characterized by peace, because that's when people really flourish. And this is, this is part of what God desires. God desires for there to be peace, for there to be order. Here's the third point. And this is the most important point. The most, most important point from this passage is this. Christians are citizens of heaven, but that doesn't mean that we are bad citizens of earth. Christians are citizens of heaven, 
but that doesn't mean we are bad citizens of earth. We, we have a sort of dual citizenship, right? We have a dual citizenship, and there are at least two different implications of this. The first implication of this is because we are citizens of heaven, we should be exemplary citizens of this world. Because we are citizens of heaven, we should be exemplary citizens of this world. So um, this past summer, my family and I, we went on vacation to Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. Had a great time. Um, while we were there, we, we, we rented a, a condo for the week while we were there. And it was kind of in this complex with, with a lot of the same types of con- condos. So we were, surrounded, we were surrounded by people, none of whom actually were from South Carolina. We were all from different places. We were all from different places from around the country. That wasn't our home. We were just there for the week. Now imagine if I had the attitude... Or if someone else in that, in, that, in that area had the attitude like, hey, th- you know, this isn't our home. We live somewhere else. This isn't where we're permanently going to live. So because that's the case, I don't really feel any sort of obligation whatsoever to be like a good neighbor. I don't feel any obligation whatsoever to like live in such a way that, that, uh, that I'm going to be a good neighbor to the people around me. Because again, this isn't my home. So if I'm going to choose to be too loud, I'm going to be too loud. If I'm going to choose to be disruptive, I'm going to be disruptive. If I'm going to choose to be selfish and just care about my own, like, happy, like, I'm on vacation, get off my case, this isn't my home. Like, if everyone had that attitude, it would make for a miserable experience, right? And as a Christian especially, like, I certainly shouldn't have that attitude. Wherever I'm at, even if I'm on vacation or if I'm at home, I still have an obligation, right, to be a good neighbor, to be a good person, to, to, be, to be loving and caring about the people around me wherever I live. And that's true politically as well. So you're a citizen of heaven. Yes, we all are. As a follower of Jesus, we are citizens of heaven. But that doesn't remove from us the obligation to be good neighbors and be good citizens of this world. Matter of fact, as citizens of heaven, we should be exemplary neighbors, exemplary citizens. Jesus came and died for the world. Jesus gave us a mission into the world. Jesus told us, among other things, to love our neighbors. All of this means that, again, we should be exemplary citizens. We should care about things like politics because in caring like things like politics, we're actually caring about the well-being of our neighborhood, of our communities, of ultimately of our nation and our world. We should pray for our leaders. We should serve our communities. We should, we should care about things like who's on our school board because who's, who's on our school board, that ultimately affects the well-being of, of the children in our community. Like we should care about these things. We should be engaged in civic life. We should even, we should be patriotic. I believe that that, that that is the case. Because patriotism is nothing other than a desire for the flourishing of our communities. We should pay our taxes. Paul makes that clear in Romans 13. We may not like paying our taxes, but we should pay our taxes as exemplary citizens. We should be such a blessing. Hear me, hear me on this. We should be such a blessing that if we're gone... People will miss us. If we're gone, people will miss us. Now, we hate to think about this, but imagine that this church just didn't, suddenly didn't exist in this community. Imagine that this church just suddenly didn't exist in this community. I would hope that even the people that don't come to this church, that don't have any relationship with this church, I would hope that the community would feel the absence of this church. Because you're such a blessing to your neighbors, you're such a blessing to this town, you're such a blessing to this community, that although people people may not even come here, they feel that blessing. That's how Christians should operate in the world, that we should be that blessing on the people around us. In Titus chapter 3, Paul is talking about a similar idea. Um, He says in Titus chapter 3, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities. Okay, similar idea as Romans 13. But then he goes on, to be obedient, to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable, to be considerate, and always gentle towards everyone. Notice that this call to be subject to authority comes within the context of being a good neighbor. Our political lives are expressions, hear me, hear me, our political lives are an expression of our obligation to love one another. 
So as a Christian in this political season, the question we should ask ourselves is, in my own, in my own political life, in my own engagement with politics, am I expressing Christian love for others in the way that I engage in politics? We have the same sort of phenomenon in Romans. At the end of Romans chapter 12, the verse right before the passage that I read, Paul says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The verse right after the passage that I read in in Romans 13 verse 8, it says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. We as citizens of heaven, we have an obligation to be good citizens of this world because we are called to love all people. Here's the second implication, though. The second implication is this. Because we are citizens of heaven, our submission to earthly authority does have its limits. Our first allegiance, my first allegiance, is to the lamb, not to the eagle. In Acts chapter 4 and in Acts chapter 5, um, some of the disciples are brought before this, this group of Jewish authorities called the Sanhedrin. It's like a ruling council, like a supreme court. So these, these, uh, these disciples are brought before the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin says, we are ordering you to stop teaching in the name of Jesus. Now, this is a pretty serious and significant moment because the Sanhedrin also had a role to play in the crucifixion of Jesus. They had power. They had serious power. But the disciples, they looked at this group of, of leaders and they said, we've got to obey God, not men. We know what we've seen. We know what we've experienced. We've got to, obedi- we've got to be obedient to the name of Christ. So do, do with us whatever you want. But we have a first allegiance and a first obligation to Jesus. We do not participate as Christians. We don't participate in evil. We don't submit to those things that undermine our allegiance to God. Paul himself, I think it's good to remember, Paul himself ended up being martyred by Rome. Martyred by Nero the same person who was Caesar at the time he's writing the letter to the Romans. I had the chance to, um, uh, to go to Rome several years ago and see the prison where Paul would have spent his last days. It's a very humble place. It's basically just a, a dungeon. And when Paul would have been brought out of that prison to go to his execution... He would have had to be marched through the center of Rome, past all of these huge monumental buildings and statues built as testimonies to the might and the power of the Roman Empire. So imagine this contrast. You've got this shackled, pathetic prisoner walking through the streets to his own execution, marching in the shadow of seeming invincible strength. And on that day, you never would have guessed. On that day, you never would have imagined that the kingdom of which Paul was a citizen, the kingdom of heaven, would overturn the very empire of Rome, that the kingdom of heaven would outlive the kingdom of Rome. You never would have guessed that on that day. But of course, Paul knew the truth. Paul knew the truth that in light of the lordship of Jesus, the kingdoms of this world are nothing. In light of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, What can a king possibly do to me? In light of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdoms of this earth will pass away. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So no matter what political season we're in, 
No matter, you know, all this chattering that we hear about this person or that person and how this, this is the most consequential election in our lifetime, no matter all this rhetoric that's swirling around us every day, you, Christian, remember that you are a part of a, a kingdom that will never perish, spoil, or fade. And your allegiance is to the king over that kingdom. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for um, the victory that we have in Jesus and the assurance that we have in his kingdom. Lord, find us faithful.